I always wanted to run out on a stage like a professional athlete, you know, with the, with the things going on in the background. Um, I actually just uh, completed my first marathon uh, three weeks ago, so I'm in good shape, ready to go. You know, the theme of the conference is decoding the future. And I wanted to, to, to touch on that theme in my first set of slides by pointing out that, uh, that the future really isn't what it used to be. Uh, and by that I mean that, that in some sense, if you look back in the past, in those days when we looked forward to the future, we had very different perspectives on where we would be today. Uh, I, I came across this quote in a, uh, in a review of, uh, of a book called Slant, science fiction book from the 1940s. And, you know, the, the, the point here was that, you know, it's very charming how people in the past thought about the future. You know, we, we somehow didn't wind up with, uh, with roads that, that, that flow through the air. We didn't wind up with flying cars or, and certainly the International Space Station doesn't look uh, quite that interesting uh, as, uh, as they had on the um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Of course, there were a number of predictions that were made, uh, in particular in science fiction, in the 1940s and 50s and early 60s that did come true. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, in an in a early story in the 1940s, uh, described the first communication satellite, which of course was not launched uh, for several decades afterwards. In Star Trek, in the TV series, they had a device called a communicator, and you could flip it open and you could talk to people almost anywhere, and that seemed really like science fiction, but of course today we all have cell phones and we communicate with people all over the world any time that we want. Of course, another concept that you may have seen, uh, this was also in Star Trek, but in many other science fiction stories from the 1950s and the 1960s, is this concept of a data crystal. And that's come true as well. You know, and I, I, I say that, and then sometimes when I, I say that, people will say, but wait a minute, we don't have data crystals. And the answer is we do, right? I have gigabytes of information stored on silicon crystals uh, on a USB stick that I keep with me. So we, we were able to create that as well. Of course, sometimes when people predict the future, uh, even very smart people, they get it very wrong. So here's a, a quote from Thomas Edison. You know, fooling around with alternating current is a waste of time. Uh, no one will ever use it. Well, obviously, that didn't turn out to be true. Uh, here's another quote from another very, very smart person, uh, Albert Einstein, who questions the possibility that we would ever be able to harness nuclear energy. Even sometimes predicting something like uh, future real estate trends uh, can be very, very difficult. Uh, here's a quote from uh, Arthur C. Clarke in an issue of Vogue magazine in 1966 where he makes some predictions about what the world might be like in 2001. And, uh, well, that didn't quite happen. You know, houses uh, aren't quite able to fly unless you uh, count the, uh, the house in the movie up uh, with the balloons. Uh, and uh, for the most part, uh, cities don't migrate uh, from one part of the country to the other. Uh, so that didn't quite happen either. Here's a quote from uh, T.J. Watson uh, from 1943, sort of looking at what the future might be like. And, and Watson said, well, maybe in the future there'll be an uh, opportunity for five computers. Uh, that turned out not to be very accurate. Even John von Neumann, in a quote uh, in an article in 1949, made the comment that uh, it would appear that we've reached the limits of what's possible to achieve with computing technology. Well, that didn't quite work out either. <laughs> uh, of course, there, there were very optimistic predictions on what computers might be. 
Uh, here's one again from 1949 in Popular Mechanics magazine where they predicted that someday they could imagine that computers might weigh less than 1.5 tons. Uh, I don't think I would be carrying around a 1.5 ton computer. Uh, I don't think that would be very, very hard. Of course, uh, if you actually read the full uh, quote from John von Neumann, uh, what he really said was that uh, you know, we may be lim reaching the limits of computing technology, but that you have to be careful with the predictions that you make because you can look very foolish in five years. And uh, well, that prediction did look very foolish in five years. Uh, here's another prediction. This is from Ken Olson uh, at the, the no longer existent Digital Equipment Corporation, you know, saying he thought there'd be no reason one would want a computer in their home. Well, of course, uh, just a few years later, uh, the IBM PC uh, was released and became the basis of what eventually was, you know, the home computer and home computing. And so that, that obviously uh, turned, out, uh, turned out very differently than what uh, Ken Olson was predicting. Now, it isn't just that we can't predict you know, when a technology is going to come in ex into existence or, uh, or you know, how, the, how the technology will impact a particular segment, but often we don't understand how a technology will be used. You know, so, People in the early days of computing tended to think of computing as being something very lofty, that it was going to be focused on, on solving really hard problems. And, and they didn't realize that it could be used for other things as well. So what I'm about to show you is a, is a commercial uh, that was aired in the 1990s. Uh, for a, a computer graphics company where they make fun of that idea. Here we are using technology to save the planet. Our tiny chip, it does 100 billion operations per second. That is power most awesome. And we are using it to make a difference. Imagine clean air, pure water, and a new future. I wish my family back home could see me now. And we are most proud knowing that we are doing our part to help save the planet. Attention, everybody. We're going to forget that environment stuff and uh, use a chip for computer games. Back to work. <clears throat> FX PC accelerators. So powerful, it's kind of ridiculous. Blast this freaking head off! So again, you know, it, it, here's a, here's a, that's sort of a funny, funny version of this. But, but the point is that, you know, we're constantly changing in the way we think about how technology is going to be used and what it's going to be used for. And the notion that, that a lot of the uses of technology would in fact be for entertainment, you know, was not something that if you went back and, and talked with John von Neumann or some of the early pioneers in the field, they would necessarily have, have thought of. Now, sometimes you predict the future very well, but you still don't necessarily wind up being the beneficiary of your, of your prediction. Uh, I'll give you a, a Microsoft example. Uh, this is a slide I personally used uh, in a talk I gave in uh, 1993. Uh, actually, the, the, the slide itself came from uh, another gentleman uh, that I worked for at the time, Nathan Mirvold. And he laid out this vision for what he described as the wallet PC. I mean, we would see this as a, a modern cell phone. And you can see this again from 1993. All the elements of the modern cell phone were in this device, uh, as it was described. Now, of course, back in 1993, we didn't have the technology that could create such a device. But because of this vision, you know, at Microsoft, we actually created a group 
uh, even in those early days, to pursue this idea. And this group created the early versions of what became the Pocket PC uh, from Microsoft. The, the Compaq iPac uh, was a, an example of that from the, from the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, it became what became Windows Mobile. Uh, but what was not foreseen was that these types of devices would become much more popular, much more prevalent with the introduction of another technology. In this case, it was the capacitive display that allowed people with their fingers to interact with the device. And it was Apple with the original iPhone that was really the beneficiary of, of that innovation. They were able to take the capacitive display technology that had been invented by others, merge it with the devices that they were designing, and suddenly they had a completely different kind of device. It still had all these elements, but because of the interactivity that was created by the capacitive display, you know, they were able to, to develop a tremendous market for, for what they did. So you can sometimes see the future, work hard at it, and not necessarily be a beneficiary of it. In other cases, you, you see the future, you do the right thing, but you may not be doing it at the right time. It may not be the right time to be uh, making those investments or, or doing that work. This is a, 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 an example from uh, 1994. It's a system that I built. It was one of the projects we had uh, early on at Microsoft Research, working with the Microsoft product teams. And we built in 1994 and deployed in 1996 a fully interactive fiber optic to the curb uh, TV system. Uh, it was deployed in, in a suburb of Tokyo in Japan in conjunction with NTT and NEC. Uh, each home had over 100 megabits per second of data access. All the elements that you might think of as an interactive TV system were in that, in that, in that system. Unfortunately, it was the wrong time because we were developing that system and bringing it to fruition in roughly 1996, uh, you know, thereabouts. Well, it also turned out that in 1996, the United States passed sweeping uh, telecom legislation that dramatically changed the incentives uh, in, the, in the telecom industry. And while when we were doing this work, there was a lot of interest among these companies in investing in what was in those days described as the information superhighway and interactive television, suddenly they became much more interested in buying each other and merging and changing the way they, they thought about their businesses in a different way. And it was really 10 years later when these types of systems became, became relevant again. So in that case, it wasn't so much that, that it was the wrong time for the technology, but it was the wrong time because of legal and tax constraints uh, or changes that existed in the system. And those can be significant, and they can have a huge impact on the, the release of a technology. So the reason why predicting the future is really hard, uh, or decoding the future is really hard, is technology really doesn't move in a straight line. Uh, new approaches catch you by surprise. So what was, you know, even though uh, you know, Thomas Edison had a sort of a negative view of, of alternating current, in part because he owned all the patents on direct current, uh, it was also the case that it, it didn't seem like it made a lot of sense until the introduction uh, by Westinghouse of the step up and step down alternating current transformer, which suddenly allowed you to send enormous amounts of power long distances over relatively thin wires. And that changed the value of the technology tremendously and caused alternating current to become the standard that, that it is today. It's hard to predict how, how cultures uh, and individuals will react to technology. You know, just think of the cell phone. When the cell phone was created, people actually thought that it would be used for voice communication. 
you know, people would call each other. But you know, many of you are students. You probably don't call each other very often. You're mostly texting. You're mostly sending email. You're mostly reading the web. The uses of the cell phone changed dramatically as time went on because, in fact, it could do different things. And so even though it began as a technology that was sort of an imitation of the, the original telephone, it turned into something very, very, very different. And I mentioned issues about tax policy. So uh, I was born in 1951. So this is an indication how old I am. And here are some examples of things that existed in 1951. Um, you know, my parents' car looked a lot like the car in this picture. Uh, this is a Ford uh, Victoria. Uh, we did have a radio that looked exactly like that. That's a 1951 radio. Uh, and, uh, you know, our TV looked exactly like that TV. In fact, I have some pictures of me as an infant, you know, near a TV that looks exactly like that. Interestingly enough, in 1951, the first UNIVAC computer was sold. In this case, it was sold to the U.S. Census Bureau. So even in 1951, as I was being born, you know, suddenly computing was becoming, becoming relevant. Of course, I didn't know that. I was growing up in a small town um, in a poor area in rural America. And so I didn't see a computer until I, I went to college. Uh, the first computer I ever worked with was this. It was an IBM uh, 36067, you know, big mainframe style computer that uh, they had at the Stanford University where I was a student. And that's the first computer I learned to program. Now, luckily for me, uh, I was uh, able to work in the very early days uh, with the Xerox Alto. This was the very first personal computer created around 1973. And uh, my original graduate student career in computer science started at the University of Rochester in 1974. And we were the first people outside of Xerox Park to have access to the Xerox Alto. In fact, here's a picture of me. Uh, from 19, this is 1975, uh, typing on a Xerox Alto. Uh, I had more hair. Uh, <laughs> I still have that jacket, uh, but I don't wear it. Uh, but I still have it. Um, now, the world's changed enormously in that period of time. And I've certainly, personally, been the beneficiary of that change. Uh, you can see some of the differences here between the Xerox Alto that I programmed on, which literally its performance was one-tenth of a MIP. Right? Today we talk about billions of operations per second. This was 100,000 operations per second. Very slow by modern standards. In fact, really, really slow. You know, uh, Microsoft Surface Pro uh, 2 today you know, is 132 billion instructions per second. So it puts, it, puts that all very much in perspective. Storage, of course, you know, the uh, Alto had a very small amount of, of storage. And in fact, uh, the, even in the, in the mid-1980s, uh, the entire planet had less storage capacity than a typical memory stick today. So that puts things in perspective. You could, however, do some pretty amazing stuff. Uh, this is a, a, a screenshot from uh, the game that Han mentioned um, that I developed as a student when I was at the um, uh, University of Rochester uh, for the Xerox Alto. It was a game called Alto Track, and was really the first Ethernet space combat game. And it helped to define what was eventually the multicast standard for the modern Ethernet, because this game required multicast in order to work. And so I developed a technique uh, for using these devices and, and using them in a, in a multicast way in order to make the game function properly. So it was a lot of fun. And you know, it, back in those days, this was uh, you know, very, very useful. Interestingly enough, uh, you know, more than 20 years later, 
I actually developed another game. This was for Microsoft. But it was based on the same game. It was based on the same code. Uh, obviously, very much improved and changed. Uh, the game was called Allegiance. Uh, you can still play it on the internet. It's actually still available. And uh, there's a community of people that still do play this. Uh, and uh, clearly, graphics and computing power changed a lot in the meantime. But I am very proud of the fact that the game got very, very good reviews. In fact, it got the best reviews of any Microsoft game until Halo. So I thought that was a, a, great, a great statement about that. Uh, but again, it, it, it goes back to the fact that I had early access uh, to uh, some very powerful computing, at least for that day. Now, I was also present during a period, I think, of tremendous opportunity uh, in creating operating systems that would define the future of computing and, and certainly of personal computing. Uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon University, I created a couple of different operating systems. First one called Accent, which was a, a, an operating system designed for a, a sort of next generation Alto-like device, a personal computer uh, that connected onto the internet. Uh, but I also created after that uh, working with my graduate students, a system called Mach, uh, which took the key concepts from Accent, but carried them over into a new world of multiprocessors. So it didn't just work in a network environment, but in fact, it worked uh, across both small scale and very large scale multiprocessor systems. In fact, I coined uh, uh, some terminology, because no one, no one really had terminology for describing the different kinds of multiprocessor systems in those days. And so I coined the terms Yuma, Numa, and Norma. The one that's preserved the most out of those three is, is, is Numa. Uh, but they were, I needed to be able to describe to people the different kinds of computing architectures that the operating system we created would, would work on. And so I needed to have names for those things in order to do that. Now, Mach went on from being a system built in a, in a university environment to having an enormous impact uh, even on you, know, you uh, on the things that you do. Uh, it became a, the basis for uh, something called the Next Computer that Steve Jobs created in the late 1980s and became from there the basis for Mac OS. So you know, Mac OS X, or 10, uh, was, the, was based on the Mach operating system kernel. Uh, and all versions of, of the Mac and iOS since then have incorporated elements from that system. It also became the basis for many versions of Unix. Um, and in fact, Mach was the first, uh, was the basis for uh, the what was called OSF1 or digital, eventually digital Unix, compact Unix, uh, and it was incorporated into many different other versions of Unix, and the technologies and ideas were adopted into uh, even versions of Linux today. And of course, it had an impact on Microsoft as well. Uh, the, er the early versions of Windows NT incorporated some of the key concepts from Mach, and in fact, the project that started Windows NT uh, was originally based on the ideas that came out of the, the mock work. So, so it's, it's had a, 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 an unusual amount of influence over the years. So probably you're, you're using code that I wrote back in 1983 uh, on, on some device, whether it's an Apple device or a Linux-based device or a Windows device. You know, you're probably using code that I've written. Now, why was Mach so successful? Why did it have such a big impact? You know, and, and I think this is illustrative of the question, why do some technologies succeed uh, even when they're doing things that, that you never would have imagined? So obviously, when I, when I began work on the Mach operating system back in 1983, it, it certainly would not have occurred to me that it would eventually be used on a cell phone. And that's because there weren't any cell phones. I had no idea what a cell phone was because there weren't any back then. But it eventually became used for things that it was not originally intended because it was designed to be extremely flexible. And it was that extensibility and flexibility that had a huge impact on its adoption. 
So certainly the ability to support other systems was important because uh, in every instance where mock was used, it, it was used first as the basis for something else, so a version of Unix or Mac OS or DOS or Windows. Uh, it had a very flexible architecture. Remember, it was designed for a multiprocessor environment. And so as a result, you know, it, it could span many different kinds of computers, both small and large. And again, that gave it an advantage. So just to tell you a story, this is um, the, the, uh, the, the man that actually uh, did the original Mac OS X and then went on to create the original iOS was Avi Tadanian with his team. And Avi was my graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University uh, working on, the, on Mach. And it, you know, he tells the story of how iOS came into existence. So originally, when the first iPod Touch was being designed at Apple, they were planning to use some kind of uh, specialized real-time operating system. And Avi and his team thought that this was crazy. They, they felt that it would be better to leverage the work that they've invested in the Mac, in the Mac OS. But everybody told them, no, that wasn't going to work. The system was too big. It wouldn't be adaptable for that purpose. So he and his team, working really without permission uh, as a Skunk Works project, took it upon themselves to, to create a version of the Mac OS at that time based largely on the mock, mock kernel that could run on what was then the, the prototypes of the iPod Touch and could then become the basis for, for a larger, larger kind of system. They were successful in that. They were able to convince the company to go in that direction. And because of that, the, the Apple devices, whether it's starting with the iPod Touch and moving on to the iPhone and the other devices, had a much more flexible, much more uh, 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 supportive, you know, underlying systems technology, and probably that was one of the key success factors that made those devices work. Now, after I left uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, I went to start Microsoft Research. I think Han already mentioned that I was the founder. I've been the founder of Microsoft Research, and and I think again, you go back to the investments that we made at Carnegie Mellon in basic research those investments paid off handsomely in the sense of having a huge impact on, on products, on, on industry, even though we were not working within a company. When I went to Microsoft, my idea there was to go to Microsoft to create that kind of research environment where we could create the kinds of artifacts, intellectual artifacts and technologies that could have a huge impact uh, on not just Microsoft, but on the broader corporation. It's interesting that Microsoft uh, even wanted to do it. Uh, you know, this slide points to the fact that it was really a decision by Microsoft Board of Directors in 1990 to make an investment in basic research. I was contacted in 1991 to become the first director. And when I got to Microsoft, I had uh, really uh, a philosophy with three key elements. These were, these were the basis for the mission statement that we use even today within Microsoft Research. And those elements, I think, are a statement about the, the things you need to do to make the investments that do allow you to create the future. Uh, first was expanding the state of the art in the areas that we do research. And for me, that's always been the most critical part of what a research organization does is we move the fr frontier forward. We, we, we learn, we test, we try, we fail, we understand what works and what doesn't work. Once you understand what works and what doesn't work, then you can rapidly take your ideas and try to move them into products. And that's, of course, what we do within, within Microsoft Research as well. But ultimately, this is about the future. It's about making sure that not just Microsoft has a future, but the field of computing has a future. I mean, the reason that we work you know, as researchers in computing is because we want to create a future. We want to change what people will be able to do. We want to be able to solve 
the key problems that exist in society and make people's lives better. So obviously the organization has grown. I think Han probably referenced this as well. You know, Microsoft Research Asia, you know, started 15 years ago. And, and I think it's interesting for me to think back today on the creation of Microsoft Research Asia because when we started it, it was very controversial, not just in the United States, but in China. And it wasn't so much that it was politically controversial, but that it was technically controversial. People asked the question, could you create in China the kind of basic research organization that, uh, that we had in the United States and that you know, you existed in places like MIT or Stanford or Carnegie Mellon? And I think we've proven over the last 15 years that not only can you do that, but we have done it. And Microsoft Research Asia today is one of the premier basic research organizations in the world in its own right, not just as part of the larger organization. This, just talks, this slide talks a bit about you know, some of the key things that I did to try to create an environment where researchers could be uh, successful. And frankly, a lot of these ideas I took from my time as a university professor at Carnegie Mellon University, where I really felt that the, that type of environment that encouraged collaboration, uh, that encouraged risk-taking, uh, and encouraged the ability to work as groups to solve problems, uh, that that was the kind of environment I wanted to have within Microsoft, and that's, that's what we've been able to do. I've also felt strongly over the years in investing in, in universities. And really, this event is an example of that, where we have made a huge investment over the last 15 years in, in reaching out and in work, trying to work with students and, and talking to students about the value and the potential of changing the world by, in, by, by working in the field of technology. This just talks about some of the you know, we've, we've clearly had huge impact. This is a really old slide from 2009. But, you know, you look at the conferences and the things that we've done, you know, there's, there's just enormous amounts of change. Now, I, I talked originally about wanting to be able to impact, you know, the real world. And, you know, Microsoft Research has changed every product that Microsoft produces. Every product has something from Microsoft Research. And that... That's really a testament, I think, to the, the opportunities that exist in a company like Microsoft and the fact that basic research really can make those kinds of contributions. Now, when people talk about you know, the impact, you know, why do you make investments in basic research, you know, they, they, they'll often talk about these things. You, they say, oh, well, you, a company invests in basic research because it's a source of intellectual property and new products. Uh, and certainly, we do that within Microsoft Research. They often say, well, you're a problem-solving group. If you've got smart people, PhDs, they're going to solve problems. They're going to, to find solutions. And we do that. I love solving problems. I have loved solving problems since I was a little boy. I still love solving problems. That's what I do. Uh, and, and that's a, a great value to a company like Microsoft, because we have lots of problems that need to be solved. Uh, obviously, you know, early warning system, you know, that's a great value too. But the real value of investing in basic research and the real value for you in, in putting your career into creating new ideas and new technologies and doing research is, is the ability to survive, not just, you know, for Microsoft, it means the ability of Microsoft to be agile and, and to be able to change and be able to survive. For, for society, it means about society being able to survive. You know, Vannevar Bush, who, who helped create the National Science Foundation, you know, pointed out that the real reason to, for the U.S. government to make investments in basic research was to make sure that, as a country, we could survive if there was a new war, we'd just come from World War II, where technology was really important. If there was a new war, or if there's a, a famine or a disease, you need the smart people and the reservoir of ideas 
that let you adapt, that let you change, that let you survive. You know, and that's as true for a society, it's as true for the planet um, as, it is for, uh, uh, as it is for a company like Microsoft. Here's a very simple example. This is actually from uh, 1992. Uh, the, we began work in 1992, and I was involved in this, in, uh, in developing a technique for reducing the working set size of programs. So basically, trying to reduce the amount of storage needed uh, for, for computer programs in those very small computers in, of those days. Now, the technique we developed worked for 32-bit code. And we were very proud of ourselves. And we, it was very early days for Microsoft Research. And we, we talked with the product groups. And we assumed the product groups would be very interested in what we were doing. And, and they were certainly very, very interested and very polite. But they had no use for the uh, technology. I mean, each meeting would end with the person from the product group saying, you know, you guys are very smart. But we don't have that problem because we don't have 32-bit code. I mean, that was back in 1992. In 1992, you only had 16-bit code in, in major products. And also, there was another element of their, of their concern, which was that they assumed that memory sizes and memory prices were going to continue to go down because of Moore's law. And so they figured when they, when they did have 32-bit code and when they were going to be able to use this technology, it wouldn't be important to them because memory sizes would be so big that it wouldn't be interesting. Well, what happened, and you see this on that little blip in the slide around 1992, 1993, and so forth, is that not only did memory prices go through a period where they, they didn't really change very much, but in fact, they actually ticked up just a little bit and had to do with you know, trade issues between the United States and, and, and Japan and Asia, and a lot, there were a lot of other reasons why it happened. But as a result, in 1995, when Microsoft was about to ship Windows 95 and Office 95, which were 32-bit products, um, they wouldn't th that system wouldn't fit in the computers that existed in those days. Those computers only had four or eight megabytes of memory. That's megabytes, not gigabytes. Uh, and the, our, the, our software had been optimized for 16-bit code, and 32-bit code took up twice as much space. Because in Microsoft Research, we had developed the technology to reduce the working size of programs by a factor of two, we could take Windows 95 and Office 95 and make them run in those smaller computers. That allowed Microsoft to ship Windows 95 and Office 95 when otherwise it wouldn't have been able to in that year. It allowed us a tremendous lead on our competitors which they never recovered from. So it was, it was a huge financial impact to the company, but a huge strategic impact on the industry. One research idea, one research idea. And that's what can happen, is when you need a great idea, when you need a technology, suddenly it might be there if you've made those investments. Well, Microsoft Research, I think over the years, uh, you know, has had many firsts. Uh, I've just listed a few here. Uh, certainly, you know, we had the first uh, terabyte database on the web, something called the Terra server, uh, the first large-scale use of program uh, proof technology uh, in something called SLAM, which became the static driver verifier, uh, the first practical use of 3D computer vision as an accessory, the Connect device that I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, the first major use of program synthesis, the ability to automatically create a program from examples, uh, and that's in the flash fill feature in, in, in Office uh, 2013. Uh, and just last year, uh, the first uh, real-time speech-to-speech translation on stage, uh, which is I had a chance to do. This just give you a sense of the Terra server, which became Virtual Earth and, and, and Bing Earth. Eventually, the technology was used to create what today is the Worldwide Telescope. Here's flash fill 
which basically is a technology where in Excel, where you, you, you take, give the system a few examples, and then it can write a, effectively write a program that, that will do what you wanted it to do. Um, and it's a tr tremendous feature, and I, I recommend you experiment with that and, and play with it on your own. Of course, Connect, uh, Microsoft's just about to release the uh, this second version of Connect uh, with Xbox One. Again, I think that's going to be a huge, uh, a huge product for the company, but also it's going to set even a new standard for real-time 3D computer vision. The precision on the new Connect 2 is tremendous. Um, you can detect small movements of fingers. You can detect small movements of, of your body and gestures that you were never able to do in the earlier versions of Connect. And it's going to change the way people think about interacting with their computers once again. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, something I did, I did last year uh, on stage at, uh, uh, in uh, Tianjin, the, which is to, in some sense, this was a culmination of something I'd been wanting to do for a very long time. And I've been trying to get uh, teams within Microsoft Research to do with me for a long time, which is the ability to be able to do simultaneous translation from one language to another. Now, I don't have the setup here, uh, but uh, I do have a short video clip so you can see what that was like last year uh, when I was on stage and, uh, and did that. Now, the last step that I want to be able to take in this process is to actually speak to you in Chinese. Now, the key thing there is we've been able to take a large amount of information from many Chinese speakers and produce a text-to-speech system that takes Chinese text and converts it into Chinese language. And then we've taken an hour or so of my own voice, and we've used that to modulate the standard text-to-speech system so that it would sound like me. So what you see now is the result of that change. I'm speaking in English, and hopefully you'll hear me speak in Chinese in my own voice. Again, the results are not perfect. There are, in fact, quite a few errors. There's much work to be done in this area. But this technology is very promising. And we hope in a few years that we'll be able to break down the language barriers between people. Personally, I believe this is going to lead to a better world. I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations today. Thank you. Well. You know, for me, that was the culmination, you know, not just of a, you know, long career in computer science, but also a dream about uh, the kinds of things that we would be able to do uh, with the technologies we created. I, I will point out I'm wearing exactly the same suit today and exactly the same tie. So, uh, so what does the future hold? Well, obviously, I think I tried to explain in the beginning of the talk that it's very difficult to know that. You know, uh, now, strictly speaking, you know, I should know because I'm a character in a science fiction novel. Uh, there's a character named Nathan Rashid, 
in a novel called Slant uh, by Greg Bear. And uh, the, that character is sort of a half Nathan Mirvold, uh, was a guy I worked for, and, and half me. Uh, you know, and that character creates the world's first true artificial intelligence and helps to save the world. So maybe that's what'll happen. Uh, but I kind of doubt it. I, I think the key thing to, to realize and recognize is as scientists, you know, we're, it's not that we create the future. We create the raw materials. We create the pieces from which a future can be created. Um, at the end of the day, it's really you, it's really me, it's, it's us as a society that create the future, that determine how these technologies that we create uh, during the course of our lives and our careers are going to be used and going to be taken advantage of. Thank you very much. <laughs>